Welcome back from lunch and welcome from the University of St. Andrews to our alumni, colleagues, friends here and watching online. I'm Catherine Dunford and I'm the Alumni Relations and Black Asian and Minority, Minority Ethnic Engagement Coordinator here in development. As you all know, today we're launching our new network that champions the ethnic and cultural diversity of St. Andrews alumni around the world. We've talked to our alumni, we've listened to what they've said, We've reflected on the ways that we can elevate their voices in our diverse community, and we're working hard to make that reality. We're excited to be connecting and reconnecting with our alumni, and to be finding ways to interact with them in intentional and meaningful ways. We're also excited to be able to make connections with current students, colleagues across the range of departments, and colleagues in other higher education institutions. Today, we're so pleased to be able to welcome our keynote speaker, Dr. Gurnav Singh. Gurnav's stimulus paper, Beyond BAME, Rethinking the Politics, Construction, Application, and Efficacy of Ethnic Categorization, was circulated across our academic schools and student body by the university last year. Undoubtedly, you will all know from Dr. Singh's high profile work in the sector and beyond that he is an activist researcher, a writer, a consultant, and an educator. If you've had a look at his LinkedIn profile, you also know that he describes himself very fittingly with the words, the earth is my country, humanity is my race, and love is my faith. This afternoon, Dr. Singh will speak to us for 45 minutes, putting forward arguments for an inclusive higher education system that nurtures wisdom and ethical reflexivity. We'll have 15 minutes for questions at the end. Again, embracing technology today, and also in the interest of pre-moderating questions, if you do have one, you can tweet us, yes, on Twitter, at SaintsCan, that's at S-A-I-N-T-S-K-A-N, or if you aren't using Twitter, you can email us at S-T-A-K-A-N at standrews.ac.uk. And I'll hand you over to Dr. Singh. <clears throat> Thank you very much for that uh, welcome. Um, I just want to begin by thanking colleagues at St. Andrews uh, and the Kaleidoscope Alumni Network. It is a real honor to be able to come up all the way from the Midlands to speak here uh, in person and despite the distance. So no pressure really. Um, I've got to kind of feel like I need to deliver given that I've kind of come so far. But uh, I think one of the kind of biggest challenges in HE in relation to inclusion and diversity is this idea that universities are full of really nice but very bright people. And uh, this means that they, we tend to look at the problem of diversity, of inequity somewhere else because we're clever people, we're rational people, and we're nice people. And that since most people think uh, that discrimination is a product of unconscious bias, then we're the least people who will be culpable given our critical faculties, given our kind of higher level of um, inquiry, r reason, rationality. And I want to argue that uh, the challenge is neither simple as shifting perception on unconscious bias, though that is important. It's much more complex in that we need to have new ways of thinking, new ways of engaging and imagining the student, ourselves, and the, uh, the enterprise of education. And in some senses, I think there's a comparison here between <clears throat> the way in which we think about, we have thought about the climate as something that just kind of, it look after itself and we can just consume and we can burn fossil fuels to a point where we've kind of got to a tipping point, I think, and we've realized we have to have a new paradigm in the way we live our lives. And I think that, and there's lots of research suggesting that issues on coloniality, racism, violence and oppression are deeply entwined with the destruction of the planet, the destruction of the biosphere and the destruction of nature, okay? So you can't really address one without the other. That's not kind of my focus today. But I will argue that current conceptions of intelligence and, and elitism and their proxies are deeply implicated in the ongoing violences of colonialism and the destruction of our ecosystems. And I'm going to argue that this is not only uh, by recognizing the inherent capacity of all human beings to be thinkers and producers of knowledge, 
that can we develop new ways of teaching and learning that are truly transformative. Um, and only by utilising the diversity of knowledge, in particular indigenous knowledge, non-authored knowledge, can we hope to save the planetary ecosystems. And here's a real challenge. So when we talk about expansion of higher education, we're not just talking about a numbers game, we're talking about the expansion of our consciousness, we're talking about the expansion of the ways we understand knowledge itself, think about knowledge, rather than see knowledge as funnel through this one singular kind of path that you know, we kind of, in academia, we, we tend to um, focus on. Just want to go to the next slide. <clears throat> so I'll say I want to problematize this conception of intelligence and elitism. I think the whole idea of human intelligence appears to be relatively benign, but discourses of who is and who is not intelligent are actually deeply implicated in, in historic and contemporary forms of racism, oppression, gender oppression particularly, but oppression against disabled people, and colonial violence. And in the current moment, uh, we know that uh, Universities have become an important site for contestation around knowledge, knowledge production, and also implicated in what's called epistemic violences. We need to look at what's behind that, what's at the root of some of these things. Now, I think we've kind of moved away from 19th century ideas associated with scientific racism. Um, but the kind of long tail of eugenics and the long tail of sociobiology still is with us and if it's not openly ad admitted I think under the surface it's still used to rationalize the kind of inequities that exist rather than to look at the system itself. So what I want to do is just to before go, launching into that I want some bit of audience participation. I've been taught that for university lecturers it's good to kind of have a bit of participation. So just going to go to the next slide. So this is a little quiz. So <clears throat> you've got to guess the institution, yeah? This institution has a policy where 57, and you can't because you know the answer, yeah? 57% of students are admitted on academic merit, 57%. But the other, sorry, 43% are included because of sporting prowess, parental income, children of existing employees, or executive power exercised by the dean of the school. Which university am I talking about? Anybody? Shout out. Okay. You, you're kind of close, but not close as well. Not geographically close, but let's go to the next slide. It's actually Harvard University in the USA. Uh, the, there's an article in The Guardian that revealed that 40% of white students are recruited through the athletes' legacies, dean's interest list, and children Harvard employees. And 70% of all legacy applicants at Harvard are white. And despite criticisms about affirmative action policies being a form of reverse racism, wealthy white students are the ones who most benefit from such policies. Okay, next one. It was a part of a movement to establish new universities in England. From its inception, this institution had a reputation of widening participation. Awarding it a university charter was actually blocked by Oxford and Cambridge. Parliament opposed it and the Church of England and the medical profession opposed it as well. It was disparagingly described by the elites at the time as a Cockney university. Which university am I talking about? Birkbeck. Birkbeck anymore? Okay, next slide. It's the University of London, now called UCL. So UCL was described as, a, as this new institution that's going to destroy academia, one of the world's leadest in leading institutions. <clears throat> okay, one more. Next slide. These two universities were described as institutions where students get a degree in making jam because of their emphasis on vocational education and degrees. Anybody? Mm 
two universities here. Okay, let's reveal it. Yeah, go on. Yeah, we're not gone there. University of Birmingham and University of Liverpool. Both Russell Group universities. And there's a source there, Stefan Collini's work, if you want to look at the sources. So higher education in terms of its shape, delivery, reach, structure and pedagogy is in the midst of a revolution of far-reaching proportions. Just taking in the projections in terms of participation, one is pondering what will this mean for our societies. And one of the most profound changes is what is described as a move from elite to mass education. Uh, and the range of proportions, I think, that we can only speculate because I think we're in the midst of that. Just, for example, if you take the UK, up to the early 17th century, we had but a handful of ancient universities, such as Oxford, Cambridge, and St Andrews and Edinburgh. Yeah, that was it. We just kind of, that was it. So universities were really kind of, some, they were a niche for a particular section of the population. But during the 1800s, with the growth of industrial cities as a result of the Industrial Revolution, to meet the technical and vocational skills demands, a whole new uh, ad, uh, range of universities, what we call the, the Victorian or the red brick urban universities, such as Birmingham, Manchester, Liverpool, Sheffield, UCL and King's College emerged. And attitudes toward these new universities were not kind, they were very disparaging. And the educational historian Stefan Collini notes that, as I said, uh, UCL and King's College also was dismissed as a Cockney University. So we see this kind of uh, tension and, and we find that these further expansions in the 1950s uh, where just 3% of the population went to university. Uh, and then as we go through the 70s, it's 8% and now it's, it's 50%. Each iteration, there's been this, oh, we're dumbing down, we're destroying education, uh, you know, we, we, education, our, our, and this idea that education can only be good or of quality if it's elite. The assumption means that there are kind of these clever people, and then there's the rest of us, yeah, that water down this cleverness, these less intellectually able people. So if we just look at the global picture, next slide. <clears throat> this just kind of gives you a sense of the, kind of the rise in university participation, you know, from the early 1900s, which was almost zero, you know, very small percentage. Uh, and, and the other interesting fact, I haven't got time to go, but you know, women were excluded from Oxford and Cambridge for many years, or they were excluded from graduation. Because again, this idea that somehow women's brains or women's minds were not suited for higher learning. It's the same kind of rationale that was used to deny women suffrage and participation in, 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 in politics as well. Uh, that they were designed for the domestic sphere. Yeah? So this idea of the purpose of higher education itself is something that is rapidly being challenged. So if you look at the global picture of the past few decades, we're looking at an exponential growth. And according to UNESCO, uh, in 1970, there were 32 million students enrolled into higher education institutions. Today there are 200 million, and the figure is expected to rise to 600 million by 2040. And the biggest rise is in sub-Saharan South Africa, East Asia, and the Pacific and further growth in North America and Europe, Europe driven by international migration. So what we're seeing is a complete shift from the power of higher education being in the hands of white male Western elites, yeah, to it becoming truly global. And that raises whole lots of questions about what we think about diversity uh, and inclusion. But I want to talk about intelligence. Uh, because I think that we've got to lance, we've got to slay this kind of beast called intelligence if we're able to become inclusive. So next slide. <clears throat> Let me give a couple of definitions of intelligence. The kind of standard definition, this is from Encyclopedia Britannica. It's a mental quality that consists of the ability to learn from experience, adapt to new situations, understand and un handle abstract concepts, and use the knowledge to manipulate one's environment. So I think we can, there's no problem with that definition. It's a very functional definition. But here's another one, a critic, more critical. This is from Heyman. We make some people smarter than others by rewarding the smartness of some people and ignoring the smartness of others. We make 
Some people smart, in short, just by choosing to call them that. So this is the argument that intelligence is simply a social construct and not some kind of deep-rooted essence of the human condition. Just to go on to the next slide, this is some interesting facts about Nobel Prize winners. Um, the USA leads uh, the Nobel Prize, uh, as you can see, uh, the USA, the UK, Germany, France, Sweden, Canada, Japan, uh, Italy, Russia, Switzerland, Austria. So if we were using Nobel Prizes as a, as a proxy for maybe looking at an association with intelligence and nationality, then you know, much of the world is, 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 is of less intelligence. Now, that's one inference that people might make, a kind of common sense view. And, and if, you, if you read some of the, some of the kind of right-wing writers, these are the kind of observations they make. Well, if Africa, Africans were so intelligent, why haven't we got so many Nobel Prize winners from Africa? You know, completely ignoring the way in which these uh, systems are established. Gender, I mean, it's even more shocking there. If you look at the, uh, in, you know, in physics, you've got uh, 212 women, uh, men and four women. In medicine, 12 against 210. In chemistry, seven. Literature, I mean, you might have thought in literature, women kind of might have been a bit more equal, but even in literature, 17%, uh, 16. Peace and economics. So you find these instruments, and you can look at other, you know, kind of ways in which we might measure academic prowess, you know, citations. I mean, the fact is that uh, 80% of academic publishing is in the English language. And so that immediately advantages people whose language might be English, yeah? So we find huge biases there as well. Just going to the next slide. <clears throat> this is one person's view about intelligence and biology. Uh, and I'm going to quote this, yeah? Inherently gloomy about the prospect of Africa because social policies are based on the fact that their intelligence is the same as ours, whereas all the testing says not really. Although one might wish that all human beings had an equal genetic endowment of intelligence, people who have to deal with black employees find this is not true. Our wanting to reserve equal powers of reason as some universal heritage of humanity will not be enough to make it so. And as for women, quote, anyone sincerely interested in understanding the imbalance in the reproduction of men and women representation of men and women in the sciences must reasonably be prepared at least to consider the extent to which nature may figure, even with the clear evidence that nurture is strongly implicated. Anybody know who said this? Okay, let's reveal it. This is James Watson, who, along with Francis Crick, got the Nobel Prize for uh, the DNA, actually mapping the DNA structure. So, a very intelligent person. Do you think these are intelligent comments? Nobel Prize winner? Or do you think this just reveals a deep-rooted view about uh, white su supremacy, white male supremacy? Just go on to the next slide. Intelligence, there's this very important phenomena of what's called the, the kind of imposter syndrome. I think one of the reasons why maybe non-white non people and, and women don't succeed in higher echelons is because they feel that they're outsiders. They feel that they don't belong, that they're not clever. And there's lots of research. There's this very interesting study that was done by Vaughan et al. Uh, 2020. And they found that two thirds of female scholars experience frequent or intense feelings of being an imposter in academia. And this was a global study. Uh, one in five said that they suffered intense and recurring fears of being exposed as intellectual frauds. And this is the interesting thing, that there was no difference between those women who work in Ivy League in elite institutions like you know, Harvard and Columbia, or those that work in their free colleges. It seemed to be a consistent feature that somehow, in an education, a higher educational institution of FE, somehow these are the spaces for white men. And you find similar kinds of uh, research on black people participating who also feel this sense of non-belonging, this sense of, sense of imposter. I still, I've been in university for 30 years, I still feel that somebody's gonna grab me by the collar and tell me to go out, get out, what are you doing here? And, and, and the fact that you can feel that in itself, I think, is, 
is a kind of a violence that we experience, yeah? And of course, because you already perceive that, then that might impact the kind of risks you might take, uh, might impact the, the sense of putting yourself forward, going into senior positions. So, if we just go on to the next slide, <clears throat> I'm sure you can recognize some of these figures. Yeah? And no quiz there. We could do a quiz, could name, name the person. Yeah? But they're all kind of Boris and, and that crew. Uh, Pierre Bourdieu said something really interesting in, uh, in, 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 his, in a book called The State Nobility and Elite Schools. He says, given that this enterprise of hothouse cultivation is carried out on adolescents who have been selected and who have selected themselves according to their attitude towards the school and who shut up for three or four years in, in a protective universe with no material cares, know very little about the world other than what they have learned from books. It is bound to produce forced and somewhat immature minds that understanding everything luminously and yet understanding absolutely nothing. This kind of oxymoron that Boris kind of caricatures. He's an intelligent idiot. He's an intelligent fool, yeah? And I'm not saying that this is what you can look at the headlines. What's going on here? What it means is that if you can occupy, if you can be defined as this kind of intelligent person, then you can behave in all kinds of stupid ways and bizarre ways. But because you're fundamentally defined as being intelligent, then you will always be so. And the reverse is the case with those people who are positioned outside of that space, which means that even if they perform intelligence, then there must be some reason. Somebody maybe has really kind of supported them, or maybe it's fraudulent, or there's something not quite right there. Or they're just the exception, yeah? So, so this kind of works both ways. Next slide. <clears throat> A very important book that was written by C. Wright Mills, one of my famous authors, and he wrote this book called The Power Elite. And, and so he's not just talking about, he's talking about those kind of people at the top, the kind of very people at the top, and how they maintain their power, how they reproduce their, how they justify their own powerful position. And he says one of the ways in which they do it is by claiming to be the most intelligent, yeah? So the people at the top of the kind of hierarchy have got there because of some kind of natural selection process, and they are the most intelligent people. And he says people with advantages are loath to believe that they just happen to be people with advantages. They come, to real, uh, they come really to define themselves as inherently worth of what they possess. They come to believe themselves as naturally elite, and in fact to imagine their possessions and their privileges as the natural extensions of their own elite selves. Now, that wouldn't be a problem in, in one sense, if you believe it might be about your own self-confidence, your own self-belief. But this is always constructed in opposition to those people who are defined as not naturally elite, yeah? It's a kind of a, it's a way to justify a status quo of elitism. So we have to break that. We have to, as it were, destroy the ladders. <clears throat> so we just go to the next slide. Just a kind of brief history of human intelligence there. Though we can trace the idea of classes of people possessing knowledge, uh, insight and wisdom back to ancient societies, back to, you know, I mean, Aristotle, he talks a lot about wisdom. Uh, it's only in the 19th century that this idea of intelligence becomes weaponized, emerges, and this is, uh, emerges against the backdrop of the development of scientific rationalism. Okay, and, and within that idea, is also the idea of scientific racism. So in very general terms, intelligence is associated with the capability that humans possess to perform complex cognitive feats and high levels of motivation and self-awareness. Indeed, human beings are generally differentiated from all other animal species because of this sense of possessing higher intelligence. We often talk about humans as being higher intelligence species. And in fact, the Latin uh, origin of the term homo sapien means the wise man or the knowledgeable person man. Now what's really interesting is that um, whilst ideas about virtue and, and, and wisdom are there, this idea about intelligence as something that's measurable, something that's testable, something that uh, you can actually classify and categorize, like we're talking this morning, 
is something that is very recent, relatively recent. Yeah, it's something that emerges out of, as it were, the kind of from the 17th century onward, and it's you can link it to the work of the people like you know, kind of Hobbes and Hegel and Kant and others, and and, and this idea of the social contract, the idea that um, power should be given to those people who have the capacity to rational capacities to engage in thinking about exercising that power. Yeah. It becomes a kind of justification for power elites again. And it's saying that people who cannot, haven't got those levels of intellectual capability should be given power. That's why maybe we might say that um, people with learning disabilities, severe learning disabilities, have certain power taken away from them, yeah? But this same idea of the social contract was used then to discriminate against whole sections of society because they were seen to be and the word that was used often, you know, subhuman, that they were seen to be educationally subnormal, yeah? And those kind of, the languages of that. People with dyslexia and those other areas as well. So if we just move to the next slide. So if we look at the European Enlightenment, I'd say intelligence was very much seen as, as biology not as maybe as the soul, right? maybe in the kind of ancient Greek uh, time, or it was seen as something to do with the capacity of the soul. The gods were gifted, yeah, and the rest weren't. Well, it, you know, one of the things about the Enlightenment is that, in a sense, we're going away from uh, explanations about the human condition based on myth or based on faith to based on rationality and science, yeah? So here, then, intelligence be emerges as a way of rationalizing inequities. So, and so, from the 19th century, though ideas associated with scientific racism and attempt to classify human beings based on biologically determined intellectual and moral characters, through to the emergence of eugenics policies in the 20th century, we see the development and deployment of the idea of intelligence to devastating effects. Indeed, attempts to erase or assimilate indigenous peoples in colonized lands were rooted in imperial colonialism centered around European worldviews of the non-Western or the non-Northern other as anachronistic to modernity, and as such, attitudes continue to impact higher education practices today, albeit much more subtle forms. The, the extermination of the Native Americans was rationalized on the basis that these people were subhuman, and, and they were like an animal species, so if we did get rid of them, it was just kind of like cleaning the land, as it were, to, to, for progress, yeah? And you find similar things happening in, in other parts of the world, in Australia, uh, a t uh, you know, a kind of genocide. So if we just look at the next slide, uh, some of the kind of ways in which this was justified was through ideas around social Darwinism and the idea that, um, you know, human beings are evolving and those people who are more intelligent are more evolved than those that are less. So whilst different ideas about human cap capability can be found in different cultures across the globe, the idea of human intelligence takes new dimensions in the 19th century and the ascendancy of scientific racism, which received a considerable boost following the publication of Charles Darwin's Origin of the Species in 1871, which dislodging various creationist myths sought to offer a scientific, evidence-based explanation of the domination of some species over others. Though Darwin was essentially interested in biological mechanisms for survival, it didn't take long for his ideas to morph into a general theory of human achievement and dominance in the shape of social Darwinism. And this was developed initially by the British philosopher and scientist Herbert Spencer, who coined the phrase survival of the fittest. And social Darwinism was highly influential in consolidating the view that human groups and races are subject to the same laws of natural selection that Darwin perceived in plants and animals, in nature more generally. And in the height of the European Imperial Project in the late 19th and 20th century, in the face of challenges faced by imperialists, both the anti-imperial struggles of indigenous populations and the progressive forces in the motherland, the idea of natural ascendancy of seemingly strong over the weak underpinned by scientific research offered a perfect justification for the kind of genocidal policies that were act act acted out. And the language of scientific classification and we've talked about classification this morning. The only reason classification was 
constituted was to justify these kind of policies, not to, ju not, not to create equity or to measure disadvantage, which probably how we use them today. Associated with all kinds of human qualities such as intellect and morality and colonial control are not coincidental. Given the natural history and the power dynamic shaping European colonial project, it didn't operate in a vacuum. It is reasonable to assert that systems of classifications that underpinned the newfound scientific epistemologies of the West reflected a yearning for order that transcended any division between the enterprise of research and the myth-making associated with nation building. And here I think our elite institutions are deeply implicated in this because they were the ones that were providing the justification, the, 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 the science, if not the church provided the model justification in the past, but it was academic institutions, and you know, St Andrews will be one of those and others, provided the justification for the scientific rationalization of colonial violences. And of, I mean, the most spectacular example of that, of course, was what happened in Germany and Nazi, and Nazi Germany and the final solution, the Holocaust which was seen as a wholly scientific project. It was seen as a project of efficiency. In the preface to the original edition of Hereditary Genius, Sir Francis Galton, who wrote, and this is, the idea of investigating the subject of hereditary genius occurred to me during the course of a purely ethnological inquiry into the mental peculiarities of different races. Galton's conception of hereditary genius and the in Intimately related eugenics led him to develop many of the foundational ideas about gen general human intelligence and testing. However, it's clear from his writing that the conception of race represent did both the totality of human nature, the in inherited essence of the human race. So, if we just move on to the next, uh, just, just go back at one slide. I just want to uh, just draw attention. Uh, the, these shoes here are shoes that were discovered in, in Canada, you know, the indigenous schools there where they were used uh, for genocidal, it, they were used to eliminate the population so that somehow uh, we can get rid of them and then we've got rid of the problem. And, and these are still being uncovered now. So when we think about the kind of, the, the, the killing fields in, in Germany and Poland and Europe, there are killing fields in, Fran in, in um, Canada, in, in, in possibly parts of America, but also in Australia and New Zealand, that are still yet to be discovered. And these are very recent. So if we just go to the next slide. I, mean, I don't know if you know, but at school, I, I used to be called um, idiot. Has anybody, has anybody heard of the word idiot or moron? I never knew where that came from. But these were classifications. Yeah, I'm not sure that I was classified as an idiot, but it was just became a kind of common way of talking about people that misbehaved. Well, actually, one of the things that emerges out of intelligence testing, the first thing that was emerged, was to classify people in terms of these mental abilities. And these were the classifications that were used. Idiot, low-grade imbecile, medium-grade imbecile, high-grade imbecile, and moron. So I, I didn't do too bad, I got to moron. Yeah? But this was based on the idea that those who performed below, I think it was 50% or something on the IQ test receive one of these classifications. And that means that, that you could justify a whole lot of exclusions, a low, whole lot of restrictions, a whole lot of violences against those people, up to and including institutionalization. So Carson says the advent of new techniques that measured and reified intelligence, such as intelligence and IQ testing, reinforced the perception of the mentally defective as lacking in rational capabilities. While in one sense this placed even more extreme cases on a distinctly human continuum of intelligence, the implementation of these tests allowed certain groups to be picked out and become targets of dehumanizing eugenic practice. So some of that was in kind of isolating people, but other was in terms of looking for ways of finishing them off, looking for ways of stopping their kind of as it were, lineage, sterilization policies and things like that. So the next slide, this is a very famous study by somebody called Charles Murray and uh, Hernstein. Uh, and, 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 and what they did was that they kind of they identified uh, whole sets of characteristics of the population groups. And then they said there seems to be a correlation between people, families where there's child abuse, poverty, unemployment, welfare, and low intelligence. So they measure their kind of. And then where there were healthy babies, good nutrition, two parent families, low. 
industrious. They, they were high intelligence. So, they said, so people with high intelligence have these outcomes, and people with low intelligence have these outcomes. Rather than saying, actually, maybe some of, I mean, these, poor nutrition isn't a behavioral trait, is it? Poor nutrition is access to resources. Yet this was seen as a behavioral trait. So people with low intelligence eat bad food, yeah? We even see it today, or they eat McDonald's or whatever. So what happens with this kind of deficit modeling is you find kind of reverse correlations, if you like, or you find this kind of one way of uh, making sense of it. We saw a similar kind of logic, you know, in COVID, when we found high rates of black and ethnic minority people. With COVID, the gutter press was saying, these people don't know how to behave. They don't know how to stay at home. Actually, it was 10 Downing Street that didn't know how to stay at home and behave. Yet we had more arrests in Brixton of black people uh, breaking COVID regulations than in 10 Downing Street, which had the record. So moving, I've got about 10 minutes, so I just want to kind of move on now to moving beyond intelligence and elitism. So we've kind of identified the problem, yeah? We've kind of said there's something wrong with this way of looking at human beings. So one idea is that we, we abolish the concept of, in, concept of intelligence altogether. Or certainly get rid of some of these kind of really suspect testing regimes, yeah? That might be one way. Might be too much <laughs> to achieve in a, in a short period. But the other one is to think about people as being differently intelligent, yeah? As in Howard Gardner's work, this notion of multiple intelligences. Uh, and, and Gardner, this kind of, this, this idea about, you know, uh, naturalistic, all these different, you know, verbal, linguistic, inter body kinesthetic. Do you think somebody who does um, dancing displays intelligence? Uh, does anybody watch celebrity, what's it called, the celebrity come dancing? Do you think those dancers display high levels of intelligence? Cognitive capabilities? I think they do. I think they're phenomenal. The amount of computing that must go into doing that. But we would just say, as oh, well, they can just dance, you know. Uh, so we need to think about different ways in which where people create music. And, and you don't need to be literate to be able to dem demonstrate those kind of intelligences. And if we're interested, you know, universities are interested in a space for intelligences, then we need to be thinking about a much wider uh, canvas upon which we think about that. Antonio Gramsci famously said, all, well, Karl Popper said, all men and all women are philosophers. I think what he was saying is, in the sense that we all rationalize our lives, uh, although he did say that not everybody rationalizes it critically, so that, I'm, I've kind of cut that bit off, but this works anyway. And, and Antonio Gramsci said that all men, and he said in context, are intellectuals in that all have intellectual and rational fac faculties, yeah? So that, for me, is a starting point for us to say, some people, are differently intelligent, but all human beings have intelligences, yeah? Talk about the plurality. So if we go on to the next slide, I think one of the ways in which we can begin to think is look at how indigenous people talk about intelligence and human capability. And I came across this really interesting, uh, it's a, you've got a link there, you can look at it, it's called indigenous intelligence. I think the first thing for me about indigenous intelligence is that we tend to frame intelligence around a kind of Descartian notion of the self, yeah? I think, so therefore I am, yeah? I am intelligent, so therefore I am. But within indigenous cultures, it's, it's often a collective sense of consciousness, yeah? So within Ubuntu, for example, and you find that within Eastern culture, we think, so therefore I am. This idea of separating out the individual from the collective just doesn't work, yeah? So here, I'm just going to quote, by indigenous standards of intelligence, the accepted limitations to perception, the lack of consideration and caring for the total environment, the restrictions of thinking to narrow confines of cerebral activity, and the confinement to narrowly defined boundaries in the rational scientific paradigm of the Euro-Western tradition are ways of seeing, relating, thinking, and doing that are deficient in most of the qualities of higher intelligence. Choosing to see and accept as reality only that which can be validated by the five senses is not an intelligent way of seeing. Adopting and forwarding a way of living that is destructive of the environment and upsets the balance of life itself is not an intelligent way of being. Opting for a worldview that closes the avenues to the counsel and wisdom of the heart 
and the spirit is to choose a paradigm that deliberately retards the total capacity of human intelligence. Now, even a European Enlightenment philosopher made a similar observation about the European Enlightenment, uh, Max Weber, which he described as the great disenchantment. Because what it did was it singularly constricted ideas about human intelligence to this one kind of idea about Cartesian rationalism uh, and dismissing everything else. So, next slide. I'm just conscious of time, so I'm going to come to a, a conclusion. So maybe what we can do is, we can, we, we, maybe it's not an either or, but we can see the relationship between knowledge, intelligence, and wisdom. And uh, maybe the way to do that is to look, this is quite a good, uh, from Jennifer Rowley. It's called the wisdom hierarchy. If we focus on wisdom, we're not discounting all these other important factors and the processes. Data still needs to be, and the wise doesn't dismiss data. The wise doesn't dismiss data. The wise captures it. And, and you know, data then is understood and, and, and it's converted into information. Raw data, that's what we do as scientists, as scholars. Uh, and then we interpret that data, we theorize that, and then we create knowledge, yes? But what a wisdom based approach is, that's not enough. We then have to then take that knowledge and take it into maybe an ethical framework, into this reflexive framework, because if we don't, then, as, as the indigenous uh, definition said, we're actually clever at destroying the world around us. We're clever at polluting the world around us. Now, who's responsible for the destruction of the biosphere? Who's responsible for global... Is it, is it ordinary people who are responsible for climate change? Who's responsible for that? Who has ethical... We all have to some extent, but I think, you know, universities that have produced the knowledge to produce the technologies to be able to excavate and ex extract oil, but then haven't engaged in wise thinking as to what will that mean, you know, we're actually limited. So uh, what I'm suggesting is that we need to go beyond intelligence, if you like, and, and, and go back to wisdom. And just a quote here from Robert Steinberg. Uh, intelligence is important to the world, but at the same time it provides no guarantee for an improved world. Intelligence was behind the development of nuclear weapons, poison gases, and the fossil fuels that are partially behind human-created climate change. Intelligence can help to make the world a better place, but intelligence also can devastate and even destroy the world as we know it. Well, we know that in America, and again you can look this up, Henri Giroux's work, something like 50 to 60 percent of research funding, the research that is government funding, is based on sustaining the military-industrial complex, or new ways of extracting fossil fuels, yeah? And, and so a lot of PhDs, lots of scholarship, and lots of universities are built on the back of destruction of the planet. But we have a responsibility because of the power that we have to then reverse that or to, to look for a different agenda, yeah? And that's what I'm talking about in terms of reflexivity, that we cannot simply be here to discover. We have to then think about what those discoveries mean for all of us. Next slide. Just in terms of teaching and pedagogy, I think it means moving beyond grading, because grading itself is deeply implicated in these kind of arbitrary tests of intelligence. When we, when we examine somebody, we're not examining their intelligence or capability, we're examining their ability to pass an exam. Has anybody ever, did you pass well, your driving test? How many people passed their driving test first time? Uh, some of you. Most of us failed. And it's not because we weren't capable of driving. Because we'd done that, we, we had all our lessons and we were prepared. It's because we were nervous, or the conditions. And that's what happens in exams. People who do well in exams are people who can deal with the conditions of the exams. Um, shift from abstract to real world problem based learning and assessment. Shift from teacher as assessor to teacher as collaborator. From vertical to horizontal relationships, including co creation. We need to move away from the violent testing regimes based on an individualistic model of learning uh, to, uh, an, uh, to authentic, non-competitive, but the principles of co-creation and collaboration built into those assessments. Um, collecting and sharing information is important, but not the same as tests or grades, which provide very narrow perspectives. Move away from grading altogether. Some people are saying we should abolish grading. 
uh, grading historically has been used uh, our experience of violence. And, and some of the students in the elite university experience that the most because they've gone from private education, maybe they've gone from state education where they are the top of the class. They end up at Oxford and Cambridge or St Andrews or wherever and all of a sudden they're mediocre. All of a sudden there are people much cleverer than them. And that has a real mental toll on those people because they've been told that they're the best, yeah? And I don't know if you know, but they have a suicide watch at Oxford in the first year for the first year students because there's a higher rate of suicide amongst those students. So we need to look at the kind of violence that these kind of regimes impose on the so-called elite as much as anybody else. That's probably why Boris is such a dangerous person because he's had so much violence probably committed against him. And why should we talk about failure? Isn't, isn't nature based on trial and error? Isn't, isn't how nature works? Isn't that how we, we advance? So why should we then problematize? Why shouldn't we be embracing? I don't agree with uh, Elon Musk on many things, but I think this is one thing that I do agree with him on. This idea of iterative learning, yeah? You trial, you get it wrong, but getting it wrong is to get it right, yeah? So just last, last slide. <clears throat> so we need to uh, accept that measures of intelligence and their proxies, such as gifted, talented, bright, have been responsible for perpetuating real and symbolic violences and are not fit for the challenges that face humanity today. That means moving towards the notion of mass intellectuality. I would also say that given that artificial intelligence is increasingly taking over the functions of storing knowledge, of making calculations, we need to think about what is natural intelligence, yeah? I mean, if we're to be teaching people what artificial intelligence can do, then there's no point teaching them. And I think AI is now challenging us to say, what are we teaching students at university? You know, how is that going to impact the curriculum that we're... How, how does it impact what, we, what capabilities we want them to have? And we need to move away from this false binary between technical and vocational education uh, or academic education. There should be no binary. So just last slide. So being against intelligence or arguing against that or testing is not to argue against universities. In some senses, if the universities have kind of brought us to where we are, they're not the only institution, but I think we can accept that we, we've provided a lot of that kind of academic intellectual rationalization, then probably we're the only people that can take us out of the mess that we're in as well. But we do need to think differently. Thank you very much. Oh yeah, education is a passport to the future, for tomorrow belongs to those who prepare for it today, Malcolm X. So education is the solution, not intelligence. <laughs> Thank you. All right, yeah. Thank you for that. Um, we have a few questions coming in on Twitter. Uh, the first is, how do we extend or adapt long-standing academic traditions to include and empower underrepresented participants of higher education? I'm a great fan of Socrates. Yeah, I mean, the, the whole kind of Socrates idea around Socratic dialogue, I think is very powerful. Um, and I think we need to, engage in more dialogical education. Somewhere along the line that got lost. Maybe we got lost by Socrates having to kind of take the poison. It became very didactic, yeah? And didactic education is actually quite violent. I mean, you know, if you, if you have to sit through. I mean, we're lucky we're not in Germany. You know, in Germany, there's this, that tradition, the kind of Humboldtian tradition where the professor comes in, reads out a paper for one hour and then walks out. I think we've moved away from that. So you know, we talk about flipped classrooms, have you come across this idea? And some of it's kind of trendy and we need to be careful. I think some of the, uh, and I don't think that, you know, oratory is still, the, there's a place for oratory. I've just been speaking to you for, and you know, in some senses there's a place not to have PowerPoint because sometimes we can get lost in the razzmatazz. But it's to engage in human relationships, yeah? Engage at that human level. And you know when students experience that? I've got a really good example when I was at school. In the sixth form, we were allowed to do sociology. We weren't, we weren't allowed to do it in the fifth form because it was too subversive. And this sociology teacher said, he used to say effing in the class. And he said, you call me Peter. 
And he took the chairs away and created a circle. And that was just so empowering from the kind of regimented talk. So I think we can change the way we engage with students, yeah? And co-creation, I think, is a key one. The next question is, how can we balance exclusivity without undermining the efforts of underrepresented groups or individuals to strive towards elite institutions? For example, there has to be some sort of benchmark, right? I don't think there has to be. I mean, if, if grades were the way to offer a kind of comprehensive way of evaluating somebody's ability, then Boris should have been a resounding success. Yeah, and Boris shouldn't have failed. I mean, the, the truth is that grades only tell you that people have the capacity to pass exams. Yeah, doesn't get, tell you about, so, so I'm not saying that we get rid of grading, but you could say in the module, because a lot of universities have modules, rather than saying that the grade determines 80% of the module, why do you say that the grade contributes to 20% of the module or something like that? You know, there's other ways in which we can slice it up. Why can't half the module be a collaborative project? I think there are lots of other creative ways of democratizing, if you like, grading systems themselves rather than seeing it simply as the individual achievement, because those that are least disadvantaged will achieve the highest grades, the correlation there. What, what was the second bit of that? I can't remember. Yeah, there was um, a second half to that question. So following that, how do we promote inclusivity in our education system without diluting high standards, compromising the quality of education, and impacting our future? Productivity. Well, I think to, to, one way to do it is to realize that all human beings are intellectuals, if you like. All human beings have the capacity to, to think and to engage and to uh, benefit from higher learning, which is kind of those slides that we did with where, you know, every, every moment at which universities have expanded, there's been this kind of raucous, this kind of uproar where we're dumbing down. Actually, we're not. And, you know, why shouldn't every human being be allowed to go to university? I mean, the same arguments were being made for uh, when, we, when we got compulsory education. Do, the, do all 12-year-olds need to go to school? Do all 13-year-olds? Yeah, the same arguments were made. But we wouldn't make the argument for schools, would we? We wouldn't say, oh, by letting every pupil go to school, we're going to dumb down education. So why should it be the case for lifelong learning? Why shouldn't education be like water? that people can access it at any time they want in any way. Surely, as Malcolm X says, education is the passport to our, all our futures. So I, don't th I think there's a contradiction there. I don't think that that follows. You know. I think expansion doesn't dumb down. It does the opposite. How should we change our university admissions policy and methods on the basis of your thoughts today? That's a really uh, challenging one because universities are, in, in essence, commercial enterprises. They're, they're commercial uh, and, 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 and they're, you know, they're selling their service on the basis of these kind of markers. So, you know, St. Andrews, you know, the top of the Times, you know, league table, world, you know, UK's top university means that it can draw in more people. I think, I think maybe the way to do it, mean, we've obviously got stuff around contextual grades, yeah? And I think, I know St. Andrews is involved in that, Bristol and others have done that, and that, that has proved to them that people with lower A-level grades are not less intelligent, yeah? So that's the first thing, we need to break that absolute link that we have with high grades and high intelligence or potential. And then the second thing is, <clears throat> I think we should um, see, we should, particularly undergraduate level, I think elite universities tend to See, if somebody hasn't achieved their A stars at the age of 18, first time round, that somehow they're just not, they can't hack it. Well, that's not the case. I think a lot of people, I mean, I, I myself, in a sense, benefit from higher education as I got into my 20s, yeah? Um, whereas at, at school, I was kind of struggling. So I think that we need to go away from this idea that somehow 18, why should we think that 18 is the point at which you can show how capable you are of Going to, but a lot of elite institutions still do tend to think negatively about students who have maybe retaken their exams. And the other one is have a lot more foundation programs where you can actually bring students in. And I know that in medicine courses now we have a lot of that. So I think we need to massively expand that. 
We have one final question. Uh, has the COVID-19 pandemic initiated the process of humanizing pedagogy? There's some evidence suggesting that um, when COVID was, uh, when we had the lockdown in universities, that that year students, um, the disparities in, 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 in gaps between minoritized students and, and white students had actually closed around 4%. And, and uh, overall, one of the reasons was that it was saying that we were more receptive, we were more tolerant, we were more um, flexible and more caring. And I think the, the word caring has entered the higher education lexicon in a way in which maybe it wasn't there before. There's almost a sense that you go to university, when I went, it's a kind of survival of the fittest, you know. It's kind of, so you can survive. In fact, they used to take pride in how many students they failed in the first year. I think the opposite is the case now. I think we need, we need to become caring. I mean, in a sense, that's got to be one of the most important skills for academics, is to learn to care and to be able to care. And that's, that, for me, is emotional intelligence. So if we haven't got emotional intelligence, then I think you know, we, we, we are dangerous for our students. Thank you. Those are all of the questions. Anybody from the audience? Okay, thanks very much and um, once again thank you uh, for inviting me and hopefully it's been helpful. It's been fantastic, thank you so much Dr Singh, everyone. <laughs> thank you everybody, um, that concludes our, thank you, thank you Gurnam, it's been fantastic listening to you talking about this particularly because I think our colleagues here in St Andrews and around the world are trying to think about how they can be more inclusive and often that is a struggle because we when we're in um, the sector we're chasing grades we're chasing markers of success and it becomes quite difficult to think about how we can be inclusive without holding on to those very tight categories and what you're proposing today is that we actually think conceptually about what is intelligence and i think that's a really important thing um, hopefully it brings some hope and some um, lines of thought to people watching that they can access um, wisdom and reflexivity in students not just through chasing grades or through those stereotypical ways of measuring success. So thank you, thank you so much for that. Um, that concludes our in-person portion of today's program and um, thank you all so much for joining us in person and for those of you watching online uh, we do have one more event this evening at 5 p.m. we have Jocelyn Pridgen an immigration lawyer in the US who is an alumna and she will be speaking about her career and her experiences in immigration law if you can join us for that um, you can register for that online and all that's left for me to say to you now is thank you all for coming and we have launched Thank <laughs> you.